So, welcome to our second lecture. Um, we're going to talk about <coughs> linearization of the EIT Ford problem. An interesting history, a history of reinventing the wheel. Um, but the first coherent account of this arguably was given by Poldemar in his uh, foundational paper. Although um, in the medical physics literature, this, the same kind of idea results, um, originates from a paper by Gazelowitz, where it was called Gazelowitz's Sensitivity Theorem. Um, but it's not really proved there. It, nevertheless, they, they did know what the formula was. Probably it's been invented many times before in history as well. But Caltron is kind of coherent account or well, at least the beginning of a coherent account that can be adapted to the purpose. And it tells you how to do a perturbation calculation for an equation like EIT or others. So, so let's first see what Calderon did. And um, so I need a little bit of notation. I'm going to define L. I'm going to say sigma of U to be the operator divergence of sigma gradient. In the mathematical literature, we tend to use gamma for the conductivity. Um, in, in, in sort of more applied literature, we'll think of gamma as being a possibly complex conductivity, a sigma plus i omega epsilon. But for the moment, I'm going to do the real case, so it's appropriate to call it sigma. So that's the linear second order operator that we're concerned with. And um, we'll, we'll look at the Dirichlet problem. So um, uh, we've got u restricted to the boundary of some domain omega um, is equal to um, some specified value, uh, we call that f traditionally, and then um, we'll define uh, the Dirichlet Neumann map, lambda sigma of f. That's an operator, so I'll put it in square brackets so you, you see that it's an operator, um, which is sigma to u by the n, at the boundary obviously, where, where L sigma u is equal to zero in the interior. So, um, so the idea here is that we fix the voltage on the boundary and we're going to measure the current. Some EIT systems work that way. Uh, in medical EIT it's more traditional to set a current and measure voltage, really because um, you, you want to set a, a safe current level, so it makes sense to use a current source. But then it's just slightly simpler to do voltage to current and this mapping which takes voltage to current in electrical terms, it's a, um, it's a transfer of impedance. Let me just think whether it's the right way around. The, the point is, it takes a voltage to a current on the boundary. And if you apply a basis of electrodes, we'll come to that later on, um, then you get a matrix for the transconductance or transimpedance. And if you specify lots of voltages and measure lots of currents, you could then work out what happened if you specify the currents and measure the voltage just by solving a system of equations. So, um, so, so in, a, in the end, it doesn't really matter whether we specify voltages and measure currents, because in the end, you know all possible currents for all possible voltages. Um, but it just does simplify this calculation, and it's where Carlton did it, and um, I'll show you a neat trick to derive the other result uh, in, in a moment. So, um, so I... It's also traditional to define R sigma to be lambda sigma inverse um, with, with a slight caveat. In other words, this is the um, Neumann to Dirichlet map. 
and um, we'll say it's um, defined for currents J with uh, the integral of J on the boundary equal to zero. I don't always bother with integrals to say what the measure is, because it's, it's obvious. Um, the, the currents have to sum to zero on the boundary by conservation of current. You know, they're not coming out anywhere other than the boundary. So, um, so this inverse is only defined on feasible currents. But, but other than that, it's, uh, it's inverse. So this is the Neumann to do it with that. Okay, so um, our perturbation kind of problem is to understand what happens when we fix f, we change sigma to sigma plus delta sigma, and see what happens to the Neumann data. So we are interested in lambda sigma plus delta sigma minus lambda sigma. Okay. So that's the data, that's a complete set of data we can measure. We want to see how it changes when, when sigma changes sigma plus delta sigma. Because that's the sensitivity of our measurements to a change in conductivity. And if we're going to find conductivities, we want to work back from this. Um, so um, okay, so, so in another way we're interested in the derivative of lambda sigma with respect to sigma. So, so we'll write that, that way in a moment. And so um, uh, in particular we're considering L sigma plus delta sigma u plus delta u is equal to zero where u plus delta u, restricted to the boundary, is still the same value f as it was originally. Because we're, we're assuming we've got constant voltages on the boundary. So it's the current density that's, that's changing. In other words, in particular, du, delta u, at the boundary, is equal to zero. And that makes things rather simple. So there's, there's two parts to this. One, one is a kind of easy perturbation calculation where you just uh, see what's second order. Um, the other slightly more subtle point is to show that what you think is, is second order or higher order at least is actually second order rather than just kind of it's got two deltas in we can ignore it type of approach. So in other words, uh, a more mathematical rather than physical approach. Okay, so expanding this, I'm going to have to start again here. You have to imagine the board rolls around because you can only video one board at once. So if we expand this, then we get L sigma u plus L delta sigma u plus L sigma delta u plus L delta sigma delta u. Should be four times equal zero. So that's just from from this, and then of course that's zero by definition. And then let, let's focus on what we're after. Um, as an intermediate goal, I'm going to understand how delta u changes. Now of course at the boundary, delta u is zero, but what I want du by dn, the normal derivative, and so I. Uh, as an intermediate step, I'm interested in delta u in the interior. I mean, just near the boundary, really, but that's, that determines the derivative. So I'm just after the change in voltage in the interior as the current changes. And that in itself is quite interesting. So focusing on the delta u, I'm inclined to put L sigma plus L delta sigma of delta u is equal to minus... Um, L delta sigma of u.
um, because I'm after delta u, so I've put those delta u terms together. And I haven't said I can just ignore the thing with two deltas in, because blah, it's small. But we're actually going to prove that it's small to the first order. Okay, at this point, um, I need the inverse of L sigma. So let me just specify that in a moment. Um, we define the operator G sigma, the Green's operator. Green deserves a big G. Um, and this is an operator, in fact, it's an integral operator whose kernel is, is Green's function, um, which solves it solves L sigma, let me just call it for the moment, W is equal to Q, W restricted to the boundary is equal to zero. And, and of course, I'm interested in the case of W equals delta U, but it's going to solve the Poisson problem with the right-hand side as a source term, okay? Because I, I have white and sums here, so I need this operator, with zero Dirichlet boundary condition. So clearly that has, that's just Poisson's equation, except for it's got available conductivity, and we know that it has a Green's function that solves it. So, in, in other words, in this case, um, i.e. W, is going to be g sigma of q. That, that's the way that we solve it. Which means the integral of the Green's function times q. And it, it, of course it depends on, on the shape of the boundary. Okay, so you just have to believe that this, opera, this, this operator, which of course is, you know, formally is, is an inverse to L sigma, so apply to q to get w, but in particular, we, we have to specify some boundary conditions for that. And that's why the Dirichlet case is easy, because delta u at the boundary is zero. So following Calderon, I can just plough in there and apply g sigma to both sides, and I get 1 plus g sigma L delta sigma delta u is equal to minus g sigma L delta, L delta sigma of u. So G, L, sigma, as long as I'm something that is zero on the boundary, just gets me back to the identity. So I've just written it one, but it's the identity up front. Now then, I'm still after getting delta U. So what I want to do, at least formally, is get the inverse of this operator. But this invites the question as to whether this operator actually has an inverse. Okay. And then, um, you know, it, it,